Well, good morning. It is good to have all of you here this morning. Have you noticed uh, that men and women remember different things? You ever notice this? Eh? Women remember personal information, like birthdays and anniversaries and first dates and the hospital they had their children in, not to mention the room number and the time of day and the weight and the length of the baby and the name of the doctor who was doing that, right? They remember things like the name of the, all the cars they've ever driven. And what I mean by that is, oh, their personal names, right? Oh, it was, my car's name was Jody. It was so nice. I remember Jody. It was, I just love that, right? That, women remember these kind of things. They remember what they were to their best friend's wedding in 2001. They remember the date and time of their first kiss. Men remember completely useless information. <laughs> we remember the top speed of the car that we will never drive or own, right? That's just the way we are. We remember sports trivia, like who was the Redskins quarterback in 1985? Joe Theismann. Told you. I heard, a, I heard a lady there, though. We remember who gave up the losing home run in the 1993 World Series. Mitch Williams, right? We know things like the size and speed of a Tiger tank or the size and weight of the world's largest ball of string. Which, by the way, is nine tons, 12 feet, 12 feet. And we could tell you who played lead guitar for Led Zeppelin in 1970. Jimmy Page. There you go. Now, here's the funny thing. When men and women remember the same thing, they remember them differently. Ask a lady about a vacation that they took with her family. And she'll tell you about the amazing weather, that they had great times together, that they had some alone time with their spouse, the, the beauty of the surrounding scenery, that they got to sleep in, that the, all the kids got along for once. And if you ask him, he goes, oh, dude, we ate at this amazing place on the beach called Pigs in a Bun. It was fantastic, right? It's just it's what guys do. As human beings, we spend a lot of time an effort in remembering things. We remember anniversaries. We remember birthdays. We remember holidays. We, we remember milestone events. We remember good events. And we remember bad events. Good experiences and bad ones. Our lives are shaped by these things. And the thing is, we don't just remember specific events, but we remember the emotions and the feelings attached to those events. That's why so many of us try to get back to something. Right? That's why so many people take the same vacations, because they remember what it was like when they were 14 and how amazing it was. They keep trying to recreate the same thing. Memories are powerful. They can evoke strong reactions in us. And one of the things I love to do, those of you that know me already know this, I love to sit down and listen to people remember and tell their stories. It could just be the story from this week. It could be the story from their vacation. It could be the story of their lives. I don't really care. I love listening to stories. And so as I was thinking about that this week, I thought, if you sat down at the diner over coffee and asked those who followed Jesus the day after the crucifixion and the day before the resurrection, what story would they tell? What would their memories have been like? When all the people who had gathered together to witness this site, the site they're talking about here is the death of Jesus, saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and then he took it down. He wrapped it in a linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph. They saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. I wonder what their memories would be. I think that if you were to have a conversation with any one of those people, their prevailing memories would have been about 
broken dreams. I mean, they had put all their hopes, if you'll excuse the pun today, all their eggs in one basket, and it felt like the bottom had fallen out and everything was broken. You ever felt that way? You ever had uh, a picture in your mind about how things should be? I mean, you had a set of expectations. I mean, you had a picture in your mind of what a career was going to be like. What was your job going to be like? What, work, you know, what, what, the, what that next vacation was going to look like? How you were going to live? How many kids you were going to have? How they were going to turn out? What your marriage was going to be like? Dreams about how your retirement years were going to play out. And I wonder, what dreams of yours have not turned out the way you thought they would? And I wonder if any of you have had dreams that have been completely shattered. And if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I wonder how many of you had things you thought or hoped God was going to do and he didn't come through for you. You see, everything we read about the resurrection of, of Jesus was written from the other side, right? So it was written by people who this, is, this was in their past. They were remembering. They were looking back to it. But in the moment, on that Saturday night, I think they would have remembered being utterly defeated because the Pharisees had won. Right? They, they had attacked. They, they had finally got what they wanted. Jesus had been a threat to political stability, civil stability, the Pharisees couldn't stand the fact that Jesus didn't subscribe to all the religious norms of the day. He didn't do life in church the way they thought he should. And so they had attacked. And they kept ramping those attacks up until finally they convinced and manipulated the Roman government to have him killed. What about the crowds? They turned on. I mean, the crowds, they loved Jesus when he multiplied food and he healed people and he cast out demons and he taught with authority. But then, right towards the end of his life, Jesus said this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. Everybody knew what that meant. And follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. And all these crowds that loved Jesus, John records their response this way. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Because he was asking something from them. They said, look, Jesus, we like you. But we like you when you're doing stuff for us. Like when you're giving us what we want. You're asking us to, I don't know, surrender and give stuff up. I'm not sure that's for us. And so the crowds went from praising Jesus to saying crucify him a week later. But I think if we talk to the people who are closest to Jesus, this isn't what ultimately what they would have felt defeated by. Because they had come to expect a little bit that the religious leaders were going to be attacking Jesus. They'd seen it over and over. They'd seen the fickleness of the crowd. I think what they would have been defeated by was themselves. Think about the straw that broke the camel's back for the money keeper in the group. When a woman broke an expensive jar of perfume and poured it all over Jesus, costing them potential money, and he looked and he said, this is not how the Savior of Israel is supposed to be acting his dreams went bust, and he said, you know what, I'm going to make some money on the side. I'll go get some money, I'll betray Jesus. And now, on that Saturday, after a fit of remorse, Judas had killed himself. Well, how about the disciples? You ever think of them? Peter, he'd left his business to follow Jesus. I mean, he gave up his ongoing career, his livelihood. I always wonder what his wife thought about all that. To follow the promise of the Messiah. And he'd learned and he'd grown. And he'd heard Jesus say all these amazing things. He boasted about being Jesus' most devout disciple. I'm the one who's going to keep it all together. And when it mattered most, he denied knowing who Jesus was. And then Jesus went and died before he could make it right. James and John, the sons of thunder. right? The ones who said, we will call down fire from heaven on those people that don't believe in you, Jesus. After three years, had nothing to show for it. And at worst, they were wanted men. At best, they just needed to lay low. And every one of them could have told you the story that Saturday night of less than 36 hours earlier of falling asleep when they should have been praying and when the guard showed up of running for their lives. No bravery. No heroics. Only cowardice and self-preservation. The women that supported Jesus out of their own ministry, in other words, they used their resources, their funds, their finances, 
The only thing they now had to look forward to was burying him properly. And so the group was beginning to scatter, and it all seemed like such a waste. And I wonder if in the back of their minds they thought, he let us down. He didn't do what we thought he would do. Everything we dreamed is gone. What are your dreams? I'm just curious. Have we have sat down and had this conversation. I mean, was it dreams for financial security? Maybe just to be influential? A stability in your family and relationships? You're like, oh, I just want it to be normal, right? Maybe if just for a job that isn't miserable. Or maybe just to have a job. Uh, maybe it's just for your marriage to improve. For your kids to kind of come back to God. Maybe it's that protection from sickness. You just that vacation that got canceled that you never got to take and you wanted to have it. Maybe it's just, I want to get out of depression. I'm so tired of being down all the time. Or someone you know, you want them to be like that. Or maybe just have that person back that you begged God to save that he didn't. Huh. Good dreams, most of them. And we hope and we wish and we pray and we expect. And then COVID happens. The world happens. Life happens, and it just doesn't go the way we expect. So how do we respond? We tend to respond a whole bunch of different ways. Sometimes we respond like the disciples. And we just say, you know what, God? I'm kind of done with you. I'm going to abandon you because this just isn't working out. Sometimes, like Judas, we just reject and say, look, God, you know what? It's not going the way I want. I'm going to take this under my hands. I'm going to take this into my control. I'm going to do what I got to do to make myself happy. I'm going to make sure I got the money I need. I'm going to take care of things myself. I'm going to do it my way. Or maybe, like the religious leaders, you've just gotten angry. You're like, God, you just, you never, ever do what I need you to do. This life is not supposed to be this way. You might still believe in God, but you are so disillusioned and upset that you kind of push them off. Or maybe like the crowds, you are just, these broken dreams have kind of left you in a state of permanent ambivalence. You ever been there? Just kind of a gray middle ground. It's just like, okay, I still believe. I might even still go to church, but he really hasn't come through for me. On Saturday night, 2,000 years ago, there was no hope, no expectations, and the dreams people had were completely and utterly dead. For some it was a small dream, for others it was their whole life. And they were trying to piece it all back together and say, well, I guess i got to go back to my old dreams. And then, Sunday happened. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, which is John, and said, they've taken the Lord of the tomb. I don't, we don't know where they've put him. Do you notice that it never occurred to her that he had risen from the dead? Someone took him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head and the cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. Everything changed. And you can read through the Gospels, Jesus proceeded to appear to Mary first. He then appeared to two disciples who were walking on the road to a town called Emmaus. He had a discussion with them. They didn't even recognize him until the very end of their discussion. He, had a bre he, he met with the disciples. Then he had breakfast with a group of them on the beach. He restored Peter. He uh, loved Thomas who doubted him. And they began to finally get it. Remember what the angels told them? He said, remember. And they began to remember all the things that Jesus had said. And they began to understand See, here's the problem when it comes to dreams. Because Jesus had not lived up to their expectations. But when we begin to pursue our dreams, it puts us in danger of two things. The first thing that it does when we pursue our dreams, and the problem is simply this, it makes us users of God and of others. 
Because when our dreams become the most important thing, and even if it's a good dream, it becomes the thing that we need to be happy, now God is a vehicle for us to get what we want, and people are objects to be used to accomplish the things I want. We become users of God and other people. It's just a danger. Kind of, we get, because we want it so bad, right? You know, at the beginning there, before the disciples understood all this, they were using, at some level, they were using Jesus for what they wanted. The danger of putting our dreams first and foremost and pursuing them, the danger of being users. But there's a second danger. When our dreams become that important to us, we miss out on what is better. Let me tell you a little story. Um, it was about four years, five years, five years ago. We were in the mountains. We went uh, to the Rocky Mountains back where we had grown up and then took a trip in the mountains with my son and, son-in-law and my daughter. And we had asked everybody, what's the one thing you want to do on this trip? The thing that you just, if we don't do anything else, you have to do this. So my son-in-law said, look, there's this particular lake that I want to go canoeing on. The, uh, it's just, it's tucked in the mountains. It's spectacular. Like there's almost nothing like this anywhere else in, in North America. I want to cano- go canoeing there. And we said, we can do that. So we put it on the calendar and we got up that morning and we drove and we got about five miles from where we were supposed to turn off and we thought, why are there cars parked on the road here? And we went up a little closer. That was the line waiting to get in. And we went to the, to the, the, the gate to this, this place and it was like, they were like, yeah, no. No. You, you can't get in. There are people that are waiting in line. There have been people that have been waiting for hours. If you get in and you go back, maybe you can get here in three or four or five hours. And we were like, well, we don't want to do that. And so we said, well, we had some other things we wanted to do today. Let's just go do that. And my son-in-law was a good trooper. He told me I could tell the story, by the way. Um, he was a good trooper, but you could tell he was disappointed because it was the one thing that he wanted to do. And so we went, we went and did this hike by this waterfall, one of the highest ones in, in North America. That was kind of fun, but, you know, the day was not quite right. And so we sat and had lunch, had a picnic, and I, you know, I pulled out the phone, looked at the GPS, and I said, well, is there at least a lake we can go look at somewhere? And there was a lake, kind of, you had to go around the, the mountain range. It was like a half an hour away. And we went to this lake, and we pulled up. It was called Emerald Lake. And it was spectacular. And we pulled up, and they had tons of canoes to rent. And there was nobody on the lake. And we got to rent canoes and spend two hours just canoeing and having an amazing time. The other place, crammed with people, busy like crazy. There would have been people you had to navigate around. Turned out to be a great day. At the end of the day, there was a restaurant. We sat on the edge of the lake. I still remember it was a great burger, just eating and enjoying. <laughs> it's really good. See? Guy. But it was an amazing experience. And what was cool was, on the way home, all the crowds had left, so we got to walk in and go see the lake that we were originally going to go to in the first place. The original dream was missed, but there was something better. And if we had talked to those people, and if we talked to so many of us, these are the danger. And so as, as I thought of the resurrection, everything that went on, I thought, so if that's true, because it's not that God doesn't care about our dreams, it's not that he doesn't matter to him, but the whole idea of the resurrection is that there's something better. Well, what is that? And if we look at what happened in the days after the resurrection, we get, we get a clue. I think there's three things that Jesus does. Maybe there's more, but these are the ones that stuck out to me. You all know this story, that after uh, the, Jesus came back, uh, Peter and a bunch of the guys went back home to Galilee. They went back fishing. I find it interesting that they'd already seen Jesus. Jesus was already resurrected. They'd already seen him, and it still didn't keep them from saying, yeah, but we're out. I'm going back home, going fishing. And you remember the story. They went fishing. Jesus appears on the, on the beach, and uh, they have this amazing experience where he tells them to just throw the net on the other side of the boat. All of a sudden, they recognize who Jesus is. They have this massive catch of fish. They come to the beach. They're kind of having this whole epiphany that this really is Jesus. And you remember the story. Because as they're sitting there having lunch that Jesus had made over the fire, 
They finished eating. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And we don't know how much time passed between these two things. Maybe it was instantaneous. Maybe it was a couple minutes. I'm guessing it was a couple minutes. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. This entire experience on the beach was designed to restore and reconcile Jesus' relationship with Peter. Because Peter had denied knowing him three times. And it wrecked him so badly that even though Jesus was alive again, he thought, yeah, but I can't do anything about that. I'm going home to fish. This relationship is wrecked. I can't believe I did that. I blew it all. There's nothing for me. Jesus wasn't done with Peter. The whole point of the resurrection is simply this. He desires us to be whole and to be reconciled to himself. Do you think about that? Like Peter couldn't do anything about this. He couldn't fix it. In fact, you wonder because he had spent at least two days agonizing over what he had done, realizing he could never apologize. He could never make it right with Jesus because Jesus was dead. And all of a sudden Jesus is there. Now it's the elephant in the room, right? Hopefully none of you are going to have that today when you have family for Easter. You know, the one thing you don't talk about when everybody's at dinner, right? But they had this, and I can just picture them having dinner there, and they're kind of having conversation. It's all sitting on the surface because Peter just doesn't know what to do with all this. I don't know what to say. Hey, Jesus. Remember that time two days ago when you were dying? And I, you know, I, how do you bring that up? How do you talk about that? How do you even get there? So Jesus initiates. He starts it. He says, let me, let me get this out of the way. We're going to fix this. That's the whole point of the resurrection. He says, look, you have all these dreams, all these things that you want in life, but the thing that is most important, that's most satisfying, is I'm going to fix what you can't fix. Because your hearts are broken. You can't make it right. You can try. You can go to church. You can try and be a good person. You can be self-disciplined. You can try and be a religious person. You can try and do all these things. None of it's going to help you. You're a broken person, and you know you're a broken person. You're a sinful person. You're not going to make it right. Not without me. And so I'm going to come. I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to be the one who does that. I just died for you to take the penalty of your sin. And I'm here to restore you to wholeness, to make you someone new. See, when Jesus rose again, he made a way for us to accept the forgiveness he'd already offered and to move into a relationship with the only one who is always there and who is always has our best at heart. Because I don't care, people, it doesn't matter if the best person you've ever met never has that kind of attention to you. They will let you down. They will not meet your expectations. And Jesus says, look, I always have your best at heart. And I will always be there for you. It's amazing. And in the midst of all those dreams of ours that maybe haven't come true, he says, I am here to give you hope where you had none, to give you courage where you used to have fear and worry, to give you an assuredness rather than being obsessed with what could happen next, joy instead of sorrow. I'm going to give you peace instead of anger. That's what I'm bringing to the table, and it's fantastic. But I think there's a second piece. Because he brings us to this, he, this desire, the reason of the resurrection is so we could, we could become whole, we could become new people, become different, and, and know Jesus and be reconciled. But he says, but that's not enough. I want you, I want your lives to matter. There's actually a couple different places, but the most well-known is at the end of Matthew, and he, he writes about this. Because just before Jesus leaves, he's like, okay, I've just spent the last month with you. You've all gotten used to the fact that I'm alive again, but I'm not staying but I want you guys, because I'm going to be with you always. You have my presence, my authority. So I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to 
you obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. We are part of God's family. Paul calls it being his workmanship, which is simply being a work of art, where he says, look, I fix things. I've reconciled. You come to me, you're forgiven. We're reconciled. But you know what? I know you want your life to matter, to not just be this pointless pursuit of nothing, that when you're done, everything that happened in your life doesn't matter. I don't want that. I want your lives to matter. So guess what? I'm going to give you an opportunity as a result of everything I've done to be a part of what I'm doing. You're not forgotten. You're not a nobody. And the level of talent and ability that you think you have is irrelevant. Because I'm going to make your life matter. We get to be something, part of something so much bigger and better than us. The kind of thing that it, does, it just, you say, oh, I can't do anything. I can't speak. I can't teach. I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. None of that matters. Because Jesus says, look, I'm going to make you matter. And that someday, when your life is over, there will be impact that are going to echo for eternity, forever, because of your life here. Which, by the way, is not going to happen because of how well you golf. I, I came to grips with that. Right? That's not going to create anything for me. And all those little things that we put so much energy in, it's like, okay, those are nice, but they're going to die with you, but this won't. Andy Stanley once said it this way. Those who devote themselves to themselves will ultimately have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. And Jesus says, that's, I got something way better. Your life will matter. And then, to crown it all off, he wants to give us this amazing future. In fact, just before he died, very famous uh, thing, he, he knows he's going to die, he's literally hours before being arrested. He's talking to his disciples, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You're going to have all these problems, don't worry about it. You believe in God, believe in me. Because my Father's house has many rooms. If that weren't so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And I love this. He says, if I'm going to prepare a place for you, then that means I'm coming back so that I can take you to where I am. Not only does he mend our brokenness and make us whole, not only does he reconcile us to him and give us this amazing purpose so that our lives matter, he says, you get me, eventually, for all eternity. Now, do not sell this short. Because this is easy to go by and say, oh, yeah, I know, someday I'll be dead. Ooh, yeah, and then I get, no, 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 no. Don't, don't. It's kind of like, uh, if you ever told a child that you're taking them to Disneyland? And they get all excited, but they really don't know what they're excited about. They just know it sounds fun. They've never really experienced this. They don't know what it's like. Right? You're like, okay, you show them pictures, and they kind of like, oh, that looks really cool, but they don't really get it. And if you've ever been to Disney, it's only when you get off the train or you get off the boat, and you come up to the gates of Magic Kingdom, and you see the castle right there, and then you look at your six-year-old. And they're just like, right? Like, they, they can't believe what they're seeing. They are so immersed in this. It's amazing. They, they couldn't conceive that it would be this much fun. Picture it with me. Someday you're going to die. Hopefully not in a horrible way, but, you know, can you imagine that you, you, you open your eyes and you begin to realize that I don't hurt anymore. There's no pain. You know what? My hip feels good. Back's pretty good. Like, all of a sudden you're like, I've, 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 all those headaches, the knees, they're all gone. I mean, in fact, you kind of feel like you could do anything. And then you realize there's someone there. And it's kind of an overwhelming presence. The light, it's, it's so dazzling, it, you almost can't tolerate it, and yet you can't even force yourself to shut your eyes. And you see someone. It's, it's a man, but it's, it's more than a man. It's someone you've talked to thousands of times, and you've never seen him, but you know him. And the closer he gets, the more he's defined. You begin to see immediately that he's got scars on his hands. And you're overwhelmed in humility. 
knowing that you're only here because of the grace that he extended. And you drop to your knees, unable to stand because his presence is just overwhelming you. And the power and the holiness and the love of his presence is just radiating out of it. It's like coming out in waves. It feels like you can't handle it, and yet all you want is more. And yet we're unafraid. There's feelings of peace and contentment, the kind you've never experienced before. They flood through our minds. There's this sense of finally being utterly, completely, and totally secure and loved. And we can't even remember what it was like to worry or be concerned about stuff. And then you feel his hand on your shoulder. Kind of lifts you up, pulls you up to your feet. And he looks you in the eye. You can't say anything. You're speechless. You want to say thank you. You want to hug him. You want to laugh. You want to sing. You want to do all these things, but you're just kind of stuck because you don't even know what to do. And he takes the other hand, he puts it on your shoulder, and he looks you straight in the eye. He says, good job. Proud of you. All those dreams that I created in you to do, to create, to explore, to relate, well, my son, well, my daughter, here it all is. Welcome home. That's what we have waiting for us because of the resurrection of Jesus. On that Sunday morning, as the Jesus followers saw an empty tomb, everything began to shift. And they began to see that their dreams and their hopes were too small. They might be good, they might have been selfish, but Jesus' desires were for so much more. His desire was for us to be whole, to be reconciled to God. His desire was for our lives to matter, to did you be dedicated to something so much more than just having much money and being comfortable and taking a good trip and having a nice family? His desire was for us to have this amazing future, the kind of future that has inspired, not inspired the, just the disciples, but millions of people since, to sell their lives out to someone that meant giving up money, power, influence, that moved to places that they never planned to go and in some cases gave up their life. These are not the kind of dreams that we have on our own. And yet every one of them would say it was worth it. So the invitation this morning is to believe. Not just to believe that God exists, or even that Jesus lived, or even if the Bible's true, that, that's not what we're invited into. The resurrection invites us to believe that God had a plan in Jesus and that he wants us to release our dreams, put them underneath his desires for us. And he says, whenever you doubt it, whenever it feels like you made a mistake, just remember, this is what I did for you. John's best friend, I mean, Jesus' best friend, John, when he wrote his whole thing, he ended up by saying this way, but these are written. In other words, I told you all about this stuff, all about these things. This is what I remember. That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. May the resurrection of Jesus spur you to trust him and have that kind of life.